I'm Annie Power. I'm a psychotherapist in London in the lockdown. And I'm Sarah Jack and I'm a therapist in Dorset in the lockdown. In this video, which we hope will be useful to people who are coping with the coronavirus, we're going to try and give a very short introduction to attachment theory, which is the theory our work is based on. And it's a, a really accessible way of understanding how people interact and particularly how couples manage. And obviously the lockdown can be very testing for couples. Attachment theory, which was put together by John Bowlby, describes that we all develop coping mechanisms. And when we describe these, we hope you might recognize yourself in one of them. These attachment strategies are ways of managing stress and stress is clearly quite a, a factor at the moment. So Sarah's going to describe these patterns. So for example, one of the coping strategies might actually be to become quite critical and also at the same time easily criticized. So, for example, you might be someone that becomes, well, might go into sort of protest. Suddenly your partner's useless or your parents are useless. People aren't good enough. A lot of a lot of feelings of the other person's not there for them, not feeling cared for. Lots of feelings of shoulds even. You know, you should have done this and you should have said that. So there can be a, a coping strategy where someone really goes into a place of protest where actually behind the scenes it's really about feeling incredibly uncared for and all roads are kind of leading at this point to feeling quite rejected. I think the uh, point that's really helpful there in this description that the description Sarah gave there is of the attachment strategy we call preoccupied sometimes ambivalent but we try and call it only preoccupied. I think your a key phrase you used was behind the scenes because the the key point about attraction, attachment behaviours is they can be misleading. So a preoccupied person's behaviour may look like protest and disappointment and resentment. But as Sarah says, behind the scenes, the real story is that that person is frightened and feeling very alone. Hmm. And I think um, at this point, if this person were, let's say, in a relationship with someone that was um more inclined to shut their feelings down in a state of panic and anxiety and not only can they want to shut down as a result of their partner going into a place of protest if they're also feeling equally frightened and anxious about what's going on around them they might already have gone into a place of feeling quite flat and quite shut down at this point these two patterns can really start to uh, to clash because as Annie's just mentioned, the ambivalent preoccupied type person is going to find it very, very hard that their partner has shut down at this point. When Sarah was talking about that shut down pattern, that's the pattern that in the textbooks is called avoidant attachment or an avoidant strategy. And again, there's this behind the scenes phenomenon going on where we if we're avoidant people ourselves we demonstrate one kind of behavior but there's another kind of truth that's that's driving us and the behavior is a, a minimizing shutting down withdrawing kind of behavior where we appear we might appear not to be interested in our partner and not interested in having any attention or help from them but actually inside somewhere very deep inside often unknown to the avoidant person there is a longing to connect. Mm. And I think the trouble is, these patterns don't work very well together because uh, as the avoidant individual shuts down, unfortunately, this can really, really, really set off the preoccupied individual, whereby she or he can really start to protest, criticize, even screech very loudly. And if I amplify my feelings, then I will get my point across. This is what's coming from the preoccupied individual, really, really, really needing to amplify because maybe, just maybe, just maybe, they will then get through, which of course doesn't work very well because instead of getting through, what happens is the avoidant is much more likely to shut down even further and go quiet, go still, go very flat, just lie very, very low. 
whilst the preoccupied individual gets going even further. And, and that pattern of the more one amplifies, the more the other shuts down, the more one shuts down, the more the other amplifies is, of course, a very common experience. Um, I'm going to I'm going to differ from Sarah, where she said these two, two patterns don't work well together. They these two patterns can polarize and they can escalate. But 75 percent of the um, relationships kind of live in relationships have this pattern. Um, let's not say it doesn't work well together. It can work beautifully. <laughs> it's it's a it's complementary when it doesn't escalate to the painful place. Yes, I would agree. I think when, when it works well, it is complementary. Um, and uh, I think also with the preoccupied, as they become more and more intense, trying and trying and trying to, to get through, there's a sense that the preoccupied is quite unfillable unfillable inside they've got this unfillable hunger where they're pushing more and more and more for something that they feel that they're entitled to they're entitled to a response they're entitled to a certain type of behavior they're entitled to care at the end of the day and they just don't feel that they're getting it i i like that description because it shows the the pain in the preoccupied person who keeps as it were banging on the door too loudly, so actually sending the, their partner away. I'm going to, to summarize this session, I'm going to give some description of how these two patterns, the avoidant and the preoccupied, how they develop in childhood. So if you're a bit allergic to hearing that parents may have a lot of influence on their children, you can switch off now. <laughs> um, but it'll be just a few minutes describing how these patterns tend to come about um, because quite a, this has been massively researched. This is not something that somebody dreamt up. It's been um, demonstrated with a number of research methodologies, um, principally one that people know quite well called The Strange Situation. If you look that one up, you'll find fascinating videos. The broad, the broad brush description of what happens is that if... Um, an infant, and I'm talking from birth, if an infant has parents who find their own feelings difficult, then that infant very, very quickly learns that they can get better care from their mother and father or whoever's caring for them. They can get better care from their carer if they keep their own feelings under wraps. If they're feeling troubled, they learn not to show it. And this is before they're one year old, before they can talk. Uh, an infant will have learned to adapt its style, its style of being, to get the best care from its parents. This is an evolutionary factor. Um, so for the avoidant child, uh, that means they've learned basically not to make a fuss. For the preoccupied child, rather than having parents who um, can't, can't manage their own feelings very comfortably, they have parents who are intermittently available. So the avoidant child has parents who are pretty much not available in an emotional sense. Um, they, they may be sort of quite kind in many, many ways, uh, and they're almost certainly doing their very best, but due to their own history, they're not so good at being with someone who's distressed, even their own child. But the preoccupied child has had parents who are sometimes available. Sometimes they can give that lovely, warm, responsive attention that the child naturally and longs for. It's the healthy thing to long for. And because the baby knows that their, let's say their mother, can sometimes do it, they learn to really turn the volume up and they learn tactics for getting that attention um, because they know it is there. But the thing that's so sort of cruel for that little child is because they also know that when they get the attention it tends to go away again they can never really relax and enjoy it so they're always on tenterhooks when is when am I going to lose this attention again so they actually sort of keep up the protest because they know they're about to lose the attention and there's a cup to end with I'm going to give a couple of picture images that um word pictures that that describe these 
which could be taken from the strange situation. So thinking of the preoccupied infant, they, they call for attention, but they can't be comforted. And the image of that, which we, we've all seen, it happens so often, is the um, child sort of pulls at the parent's clothes and wants to be picked up. The parent picks them up to, to cuddle them close, but the child arches away, still crying. They want it to be picked up, but it doesn't soothe them. And it's a, it's a miserable dilemma that child is in. Hmm. And the avoidant child, an image that summarizes the avoidant child is that they, they quite probably get on quite quietly playing with their toys, perhaps in a slightly desultory way, not in a very exploratory, lively way. And they don't look too troubled whether their parent is close by or even leaves the room. But researchers have shown through tracking their, their, their pulse and their cortisol levels, blood cortisol levels, these children are actually registering a very high level of anxiety. It doesn't show in their behavior. They're managing it all internally. And whichever pattern we tended to have in childhood, and of course some people have this secure pattern, which is an enormous blessing. Huge number of people have this secure pattern, by the way. And a small and a minority of people have a, a really troubled pattern, which is called a disorganized pattern. Those children have had a very, a very painful experience. They've had the experience that their own caregiver is also a source of fear. So that that infant is or child is in a complete dilemma as to whether to turn towards or to run away from. The person who is the source of both fear and and possible comfort. I think you've summarised the stress pattern really well. But I, I want to end with the thought about the avoidant and the preoccupied because most of our videos will be thinking about how this um, pursuer and withdrawer, the the tangles that they get into and the spiral that they get into when they're stressed. Goodbye. Often in a couple, there's one person who pursues who who seeks more connection and one person who withdraw tends to withdraw and seeks more autonomy